Good to see everybody this morning. Glad that you're here. Hey, uh, let me welcome our online church as well and those that watch us online. We always appreciate you joining in. want to encourage you to uh, get your tablet ready, your device, or get a pen and paper. You might want to take some notes on some of the things we're going to talk about today. But we're going to continue the series. In fact, we're going to try to wrap up the series today that we began on the tabernacle. And uh, if I can talk fast enough to get everywhere we need to go, we will actually do that today. If you remember last week, I, I did a message that I, I called a walk through the tabernacle. Today, we're going to do a jog through the tabernacle because, because we've got a long ways to go. Well, let's jump right in uh, to the, the tabernacle. And uh, remember, the tabernacle is all about Jesus. In fact, everything in the tabernacle, everything about the tabernacle is a picture or a portrait of who Jesus is. It reveals a little more of who he is. It shows us something about his nature, and it shows us what our relationship with him is. And so that's why it's important that we look at the tabernacle and understand everything about it that we possibly can. Well, I've got the picture up here of the overall tabernacle. This is the way that it looked in the wilderness. And uh, I want you to notice the first thing about this tabernacle is that there is a fence that goes around the entire tabernacle. In other words, it is a dividing line between the tabernacle and the world. What does that mean exactly? How many of you know this morning that we live in a broken world, right? But just because we live in a broken world doesn't mean that we have to be broken. We live in a dark world, but just because we live in a dark world doesn't mean we have to live in darkness. We live in a corrupt world, a perverted world. But just because we live in this world doesn't mean we need to be corrupted or perverted or, or any of those other things. But here's what it means. When you look at the fence that goes around the tabernacle, it is sending a message that you are either in the kingdom of God or you are outside of the kingdom of God. There is no in-between. Either you are for God or you are against God. There's only two categories. There's not the saved and the unsaved and those that are saying, I'm seriously thinking about being saved. No, either you're in or you're out. In fact, James chapter 4 says this, says that if you are friends with the world, if you associate with the world, that makes you an enemy of God. So it's very black and white, and that's what that fence is showing, is that there is a dividing line between us and God. If we zero in a little bit more and begin to look at the curtain of that, it represents Christ's righteousness. It's white. White represents righteousness. And it, that, that curtain also, not only does it keep things out, but if you're inside, it's a boundary for your life. So there's a protection of being in Christ. Let me, let me answer the question, what does it really mean to be in Christ? And that could literally be a whole sermon series of itself. But it means that everything that I'm not, Jesus is. When I, if I'm living a life in Christ, it means everything that I'm not, Jesus is. When I'm weak, guess what? He's strong. When I'm defeated, he's victorious. When I'm sick, he is my healing. When I'm poor, he is rich. So whatever I'm not, he is, and I can look to him. I don't have to do life on my own or in my own, in my own strength. I can rely upon his wisdom, his strength, his righteousness. That's what it means to live in Christ. Then there are the posts that are set between the, the sections of the curtains there. I want to I take a close-up look of that. And if you remember, this wood is made of acia wood. Now, acia wood is a very hard wood, but it's a very ugly wood. It's very gnarly. In fact, it grows in the desert and in very, in very hostile conditions. And uh, it represents Christ. In fact, it is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 53 but when it says this, that he like a root, Jesus like a root out of the ground, has no form of comeliness. He was saying that word comeliness means there's nothing about him that would make you want to worship him or the appearance that we should delight in him. In other words, he wasn't charismatic. We didn't, he wasn't who he was because of his personality or because of his looks, but it was something that he was from the inside. His humanity was nothing to be glorified, but it, it was everything that he was inside that we were drawn to. Now then, take a look at, at the gate. We talked about all this last week, so this is just a quick review. And the first thing that you notice about the gate and this is what I love about the gate, is that it's 30 feet wide. That's for a reason. It's 30 feet wide. This is what I call the whosoever will gate. In fact, I want to add this statement to it. The reason that gate is 30 feet wide is that God is sending a message 
that whosoever wants to come to him can come. And what I want to say is this, is that God's not trying to keep people out of heaven. He's trying to open doors so wide to get people into heaven. Amen. So that gate represents that whosoever will, John 3, 16, for God so loved the whole wide world that whoever believes in him, there's no qualification or disqualification. If you just simply believe in him, he says, you will be saved. So it's not your past that's going to hold you back. It's not your philosophy that's going to hold you back. It's not any mistakes that, that are going to hold you back. If you believe Jesus said, come to me, I will receive you. All you have to do is confess and believe. There are four colors on the gate, and each color speaks of one of the attributes of Christ. First of all, the blue. How many know that Jesus came from heaven? I want you to think about that for just a moment. He came from heaven to earth. We're doing just the opposite. We're just trying to get out of this stinking earth so we can get to heaven. Jesus left behind his title. He left behind his, 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 his kingdom. He left behind everything to come here and to live with us so that we could identify with him. He came to identify with us so that we could in turn identify with him. The scarlet represents his death, his sacrificial death. He came to be the perfect sacrifice, not a, not a sacrifice, but he came to be the perfect sacrifice. So there never needs to be another sacrifice. Our sin has been forgiven. The purple in the, in the gate there in the material represents his royalty. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and his white represents his sinlessness. That's why he was the perfect sacrifice. Now, look at the brazen altar. This is where we spent most of our time last week looking at this altar. In fact, once you come through the gate, the first thing that you are confronted with is this brazen altar, which is Jesus. It's a representation of Jesus. It, it represents sin and dealing with sin. Now, back up to the gate, because once we get through the gate, we've got to decide what are we going to do with Jesus. See, I kind of think of the gate as the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's primary ministry is to draw us to Christ. Do you realize this morning that you could not be saved if it weren't for the Holy Spirit drawing you? That if you're ever listening to a sermon and if you're not saved, if you're not right where you need to be and you're listening to somebody preach, it's not that they're such a great preacher, it's that such the Holy Spirit is such a great drawer, all right? So if something's not right in your life, he will draw you to repentance. If something's not right in your life, he will draw you to Christ. You cannot get saved without the Holy Spirit. If you remember when we talked about the book of Revelation, there are some theologians that say, well, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken off of the earth. That is, to my mind, that is virtually impossible because we know that literally thousands upon thousands of people are saved during the tribulation period. But you cannot be saved unless the Holy Spirit is drawing you. So the Holy Spirit remains on the earth. His primary function is to draw us to Christ and to a closer relationship with Christ. So once he, that's why if you're ever sitting in a service and your heart is pounding around all time, there's a reason for that. It's the Holy Spirit dealing with you. If you ever just feel like, man, something's not right, and you know, you're just doing everything you can to say, I don't want to go forward. I don't want to respond to this. It's the Holy Spirit that you need to respond to. He's drawing you, and that's a good thing. So once he draws us to Christ, we've got to make the decision, what am I going to do with Jesus? First of all, it represents the cross because something had to die there to cover our sins. And so Jesus has already died not to cover our sins. How many know this morning our sins aren't covered? They're gone. Jesus didn't cover up our sins. He washed away our sin. So in the Old Testament, they made a sacrifice to push their sins forward. But today, when we come and confess our sins to Christ, they're gone. They're removed. They're forgotten. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, God has totally forgotten about our sins. He's removed them out of our life. Come on. That's good news. Amen. Amen. So we come to this place. Notice on this, uh, on this brazen altar, there's a place, there was a fire, there's a big fire pit actually. There is a berm or a ramp that goes up to that. They had to take the sacrifice, bring that sacrifice up, kill it, lift it up over, and then drop it into the, uh, the brazen altar there. That also is a picture of Christ. What did Jesus say? He said, if I be lifted up, you had to lift up your sacrifice. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Again, that's that's why we, every week we look at our services and we ask ourselves as a staff, were we successful in lifting up Jesus? Because it's not about Cornerstone, it's about Jesus. Cornerstone exists to lift up Jesus. Because if we lift him up, then we know lives are going to be changed. So that's the most important thing. So the, the sacrifices that they brought, again, was very important because you couldn't just bring any sacrifice. 
You couldn't just look around and say, I'll bring this or I'll take that, whatever livestock I have on hand. God said it has to be very specific. It has to be a, a split hoof, has to be an animal that chews its own cud. And there's a picture there is that we come to God not, on our, not by our ways, we come to God by his ways. See, salvation is not what I think it is. Salvation is what God says it is. The reason that's important is because we, we have the type of, uh, of people that think, well, you know, here, here's the deal. I, I, I'm, I, I've got to be going to heaven because I'm a good person. I'm sure you are. But salvation doesn't come from you being a good person or a bad person. There are people that say, well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven because I grew up in a Christian home. I've got Christian parents. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm glad you did, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Pastor, I know I'm a Christian. I'm Baptist. Thank God. I'm glad you are. But that doesn't make you a Christian. I love the Baptist. I married a Baptist. I believe in the Baptist. It's not what we say salvation is. It's what God says salvation is. Notice also on this altar, there are four horns on there. That is significant also because it represents four people groups. There are four horns on the altar for the same reason there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because each gospel was written to a different people group. God is trying to show that the gospel isn't just for one group, for one church, for, for, for one race. It's for everybody. It is a whosoever will gospel. So it's for every people group. It's for every tribe. Nobody is disqualified. Whoever wants to come to Jesus can find forgiveness of their sins at the foot of the cross. And so this represents the cross of Jesus Christ. After you went past the, the, the brazen altar where sin had to be dealt with, Christ dealt with our sin, amen. But we have to come to the place to say, what am I going to do about his sacrifice? And we deal with our sin on a personal level. Then you come to the labor. Let's talk about that for just a moment because we didn't quite have time to get to it last week. The labor, if you remember from a scripture out of Exodus chapter 38, tells us that this was made out of brass and out of brass mirrors. They didn't have glass mirrors. They had highly polished brass mirrors. And so the Bible tells us that. And so there's, some, there's a message that is there about the labor. How many of you know this morning that mirrors don't lie? How many of you are thankful this morning that mirrors don't laugh? I just thought I'd throw that in. I know I am. James chapter 3 says that the word of God is like a mirror. That when you look into the word of God, you get an accurate reflection of what you really look like. Amen? Or ouch. It just depends. See, the word of God doesn't lie. When you look into the word of God, it, it tells you where you are. In other words, I could say it this way, that the labor, when I look into the labor, when I look into the word of God, it is the standard by which I judge myself. I don't judge myself compared to other people. I don't look around and say, well, I, I'm a better Christian than this guy over here, and I'm a much better Christian than this guy over here. That doesn't matter. It doesn't count. That's not what God judges us by. I don't get to compare sins. I don't get to look at someone and say, they do the bad sins. I only do the good sins. I would never sin the way that they sin. How foolish is that? Sin is sin. So I don't get to compare my sin with someone else either. I only get to compare myself to the word of God. And, I, and it shows me reflection of who I am. And it shows me what the standard is. If you've ever gone to the state fair or gone to an amusement park where they have the house of mirrors, right? And you walk into this house of mirrors, and each mirror is going to give you a different reflection. One makes you look long and tall. The other makes you look deep and wide. And no matter which mirror you go to, you get a different picture of what you look like. And you just keep walking around until you find a mirror that makes you look good. But each mirror gives a different reflection, and that is why people today like to deconstruct the Word of God. That is, a, that is a new terminology that has been introduced just in this generation, that we have people that deconstruct the Word of God. In other words, they'll look at the Bible and see what the Bible says and not like, not like what it says because it convicts them, so we have to de deconstruct it and break it down, and I've got to find scriptures that will make it say what I want it to say. Do you realize that you can make the Bible say anything? you wanted to say if you pull scripture out of context. 
So the purpose of looking into the word of God, if it makes me feel bad, is not to deconstruct it and dumb the Bible down and find a gospel that I can live with, but it's for me to change my life and fall into the line or to the standard of God's word so that I can be what God calls me to be. So the mirror is a reflection. It's a discipleship tool. It's something that I look at. It's a report card for my life to know where I'm at. And the Holy Spirit always shows me how to get better. Ephesians 5.25 says that, that, that Jesus would sanctify and cleanse you by the washing of water by the word of God. So the lavers where the high priest would come and wash himself just before, we go, just before going into the holy place. So he would wash himself of, of just all the debris, all the things in his life. And so if he sinned before he got into the, into the holy place, he had to go back and wash again. If he cursed, if, if he had a bad thought, if he had a bad attitude, he had to go back and wash himself again. Whatever it was before, he went back into the holy place there. And that just makes me think of 1 John 1, 9 that says if we confess our sins, because even after becoming a Christian, how I many know we sin? Even after becoming a Christian and I sin doesn't disqualify me, Jesus said, just confess your sin. Confess your sin. Just admit it and quit it. So when I sin and make a mistake, 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sin, he is what? He is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That is the washing of water by the word of God. That is a spiritual labor in my life. Now, another interesting thing about the labor is this. It had no measurements on it. We really don't know what size that it was. That's interesting because everything else in the tabernacle, every piece of material, every cord, every board, every piece of metal, every object in there was measured. Everything was measured to the nth degree except for the laver. Did God mess up? Did God forget something? Did God leave something out? No. God wanted to communicate something. And here's what it is. To measure something means that it had limits. You could limit it. God is trying to show by not giving any measurements to the lather, to the laver there, that there are no limits to God's mercy. No matter how many times you sin, if you keep showing back up and asking for forgiveness, God's going to forgive you. Now, there's, no, there's no limit to his mercy. There's no limits to his power. There's no limit for his ability to cleanse you. Whatever you do, God wants you to know it'll never be, it'll never be on his fault or his end that you don't get forgiven. So I have people ask, not, not all the time, but regular people ask me, what's the unpardonable sin? Because nobody wants to commit the unpardonable sin, right? The unpardonable sin is when you sin against the Holy Spirit. Remember I said a moment ago, the Holy Spirit is the only way you get to Christ? The unpardonable sin is when I continually reject the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the point that the Holy Spirit no longer deals with me. The unpardonable sin is when I keep rejecting God, putting off God, rejecting the Holy Spirit, pushing him away from my life until there come a day, the Bible says that the Spirit of God will not always strive with the hearts of men. There comes a day in my life when the Holy Spirit says, you want to be left alone? I'll leave you alone. Fine. I'm done. That's the unpardonable sin, not because God won't forgive it, but because you hardened your heart so bad, there's, there's, there's no way you're going to come to God. So we, we want to stay sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's important when you sin, confess your sin. Years ago, before I went into full-time ministry, I worked for an oil company. And I was a salesman. I sold packaged oil. I sold it by the can, by the case, by the, by the gallon, by the 55-gallon, by the, by the truckload. So a lot of my job was every day I was out in the oil field, had to wear a suit and tie. That's the way it was back in the day. Had to wear a suit and tie. And no matter how hard I tried to stay clean, every day I came home dirty. I was in a dirty environment. I was in an oily environment. Everything I touched, everything I leaned on, everything I walked by was covered with dirt or grease. So every day I had to cleanse myself. I had to wash myself, wash my clothes because of the environment that I was in. How many know we live in a dirty world? We live in a world that we just get out in the world. We, we just rub up against the world, whether you're intending to or not. You need a daily cleansing of just coming before God and receiving forgiveness from God. Just getting right with God is so important in our life. So after the priest would do that, it brought him to the place, what we call the holy place, actually going inside of the tent now. Now, once you go inside of the tent in the holy place, there are three pieces of furniture. We're going to talk about them a little more in detail today. The first thing that was in there what was, is what was called the, the table of showbread. And this was 12 loaves of bread, flat bread, that one from each of the 12 tribes that made up the nation of Israel. And one would be baked on behalf 
of each tribe and put in the holy place to represent them. But it wasn't just bread. It was called unleavened bread. And the Bible talks quite a bit about this. In fact, Matthew 16, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, beware. He said to them, listen, beware, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, what leaven means, leaven is like yeast. That's what makes bread puff up. That's what, that's what makes it rise. And so when it mentions leaven, it's talking about being puffed up or being prideful. There are so many sermons here, just if we could just spend a few moments talking about pride. Literally, I could make a series out of this. But let me just give you some thoughts on this. Religion is always full of pride. That's why God's not interested in religion. He's interested in relationship. There are people that, that are so hung up on their religious traditions, we got to do church this way, or hung up on their denomination because we got to do the way my denomination says. That's religion. That's puffed up. It's always been about Jesus and not the religion. It doesn't matter what the, what the sign of the church is outside. It's what's going on on the inside. Amen. We, we are cornerstone. We are a non-denominational church meaning we don't really belong to any organization, so to speak. Now, when I say we're non-denominational, I don't mean anti-denominational. I'm for every church in town. If they are preaching the gospel, if they are reaching people, if they are helping people, praise God, I am for them, amen. And we pray for them, we lift them up. But we are non-denominational, meaning we just kind of do our own thing. We have a board that we're governed by. We, we, we don't belong to any particular organization, so to speak. In fact, we're made up of Baptists. We got, we got Baptists. We got Catholics. We got ex-Catholics. We got Pentecostals. We got Church of Christ. We got all these people. In fact, I don't want to scare anybody this morning. I, I don't want this to be a trigger moment, but I need this to be a public service announcement. Some of you may be sitting next to a Pentecostal. <laughs> don't be afraid. All I can tell you is don't make any sudden moves. <laughs> If you make a sudden move around a Pentecostal, you may start something, all right? You don't want to do that. Everybody just stay calm, and, and you'll be all right. But we all come together. We're kind of a Heinz 57 church. We just come from everywhere, come together, because we want to focus on Jesus. And as long as I keep preaching Jesus, I mean, no, we're cool. As long as I keep lifting up Jesus, as long as we keep saying it's all about Jesus, we're not trying to build a church. We're trying to build the kingdom. So it's all about Jesus. Religion is always full of pride. We're talking about leaven. Here's one, 1 Corinthians 13 says that love is not puffed up. Love is always humble. Love doesn't get full of itself. Love always keeps reaching out. I wrote this down. I thought this was good. How many know God will never promote your pride? Not many. Well, it's true. And then, then I just feel like God dropped this in my spirit. This is so powerful. If you are full of yourself, you can't be full of the spirit. I'd rather be full of the Spirit than to be full of myself. So the unleavened bread showed that Christ lived a sinless life. But not only that, but on top of that, that bread also represents some other things. It represents daily bread. It represents the Word of God. It works living bread, spiritual bread. It's important that we, that we have the right things. In fact, one of, my, one of my Bible teachers when I was in Bible school used to make this statement. He said, we give our bodies three square meals a day. But we're lucky if we feed our spirits one cold snack a week. How many know you are what you eat? Are there any little Debbies in the house? <laughs> Just a few, amen. If you eat unhealthy, you'll be unhealthy. If you eat junk, you're gonna feel like junk. So the question is, how is your spiritual appetite? We should be desiring to feed on the word of God. I, I made this statement Wednesday night is that there, there's a statistic that came out that said the average person will long, log on to Facebook 30 times a day. Stop and think for a moment how different your life would be if you logged into the faith book 30 times a day. Can you imagine if you picked your Bible up 30 times a day and just read a scripture, 30 scriptures a day? I kind of have a feeling that might change your life. It might help your attitude. It might help your marriage. It might help you. So you are what you eat. Let's hunger for the things of God. Let's hunger for the word of God. So the first thing that you came into was the, uh, was the, the table of showbread. The second thing was the lampstand. Now, the lampstand is the Holy Spirit. When you look at this lampstand, notice that it has seven branches. The seven branches represents the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, there are nine gifts of the Spirit that the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians. There are nine fruit of the Spirit. There are many manifestations of the Spirit. But there are seven ministries of the Holy Spirit that are mentioned in the book of Isaiah. But one of the things about this is that the high priest would come in and that this, in, in this outer sanctuary, and every day this, this lampstand would be filled with oil on a daily basis. Anybody see where I'm going with that? There is one infilling of the Holy Spirit, but there are many refillings of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit every day. You need to make sure that you have an up-to-date, on-fire, on-time relationship with God. Be filled with the Spirit. The other interesting thing is, is this, is that the lampstand was there to eliminate, to illuminate the table of showbread and to illuminate the altar of incense. It's so you could see in the tent. Let me tell you what the Holy Spirit does. Not only does the Holy Spirit draw you to Christ, but the Holy Spirit opens up the Word of God to you. Do you realize that if you read your Bible without the Holy Spirit, you won't get anything out of it? It's the Holy Spirit that makes the Bible come alive. Your Bible is not like any other book on the face of the earth. It is a living Word to you. If you've ever been reading your Bible and you read something on there and it just jumps off the page at you, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's the Holy Spirit giving you a word. That's the Holy Spirit giving direction to your life. There are times that I've read scriptures a hundred times, but I read it that hundred and first time and it leaps off the page and I realize God's talking to me. God's showing me something. That's something God wants me to know or that's something that God wants me to share with somebody else. So it's the Holy Spirit that allows me to understand the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit that illuminates the all of incense, which is my prayer and my worship. So it's the Holy Spirit shows me how to pray. The Holy Spirit energizes your prayer life and the Holy Spirit illuminates the word of God to you. Then just before you go into the holy place, and this was put there very strategically, is the altar of incense. There's a lot of details about this, about where the coals came from and what the, uh, what the incense meant and all of those things. We're just kind of staying with the headlines today. But it was placed just before you go into the Holy of Holies. So there's a message there that we need to understand. The altar of incense represents our prayers and represents our worship. The closest you can get to God in this life before you go to heaven is through prayer and through worship. If you want to draw close to God, begin to become a man or woman of prayer. If you want to get close to God, learn to be a worshiper. It is our prayers and it is our worship that brings us close to God. And so if I'm ever feeling like God is far away, he hasn't moved, I just need to pray and I need to seek God and I need to worship God, and God always shows up on the scene, right? Remember the scripture that, that God inhabits the praises of his people? That means when I praise God, he begins to show up and live in my praise. If we as a church praise him a little bit, he'll show up a little bit. But how many know if we praise him a whole lot, he'll show up a whole lot. So God inhabits the praises of his people. So there is a special incense that was made according to God's direction. Again, you can't pray according to your will, but you need to pray according to God's will. Remember the disciples asked Jesus, and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. So that means there's a right way to pray and there's a wrong way to pray. And they say, Jesus, we want to pray the right way. I found out that what a lot of people call prayer is not prayer. Let me say that again. What a lot of people call prayer is not prayer. What a lot of people call prayer is nothing more than whining. What a lot of people call prayer is nothing more than complaining to God about their circumstance. That's not prayer. Prayer is when you begin to base it upon the Word of God, and you pray the Word of God, and you dismiss fear. You're not complaining, but you're speaking to God. Now, I understand it's okay to get real with God. There's times that I've got real with God, and I just told God, I'm mad. I, I'm upset with you. And I tell God that. And he lets me tell him that. And then he corrects me. <laughs> and then he shows him that I'm wrong, and not him. But it's okay to tell God. If you're being honest, it's okay to tell God. But listen, your problem is never on God's end. God's not your problem, amen? Let me say that again. God's not your problem. God's your answer. God is your help. So if things aren't lining up, don't blame God. Look in the mirror, amen, and find out what do I need to do? Why do I not feel close to God? Then you came to the veil. And this is a thick curtain, in fact, it's hard to describe. It was a beautiful piece of tapestry. 
It was woven together. It was four inches thick, and it was beautiful. There was all types of, of, of artwork that was engraved in that. And it's what separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Because once, once you went past this curtain, you entered into that holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. So only the high priest could enter into the holy of holies once a year to make sacrifice. It was on the day of atonement. That's when he would go in and take blood and literally spink, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And so this veil that we're talking about, this dividing line, so to speak, is the veil that when Jesus died on the cross and when Jesus said, it is finished, the Bible says that the veil in the temple, Solomon's temple at that time, but the same veil, was ripped from top to bottom. So this four-inch thick piece of woven cloth tapestry by the hand of God was ripped from the top to the bottom. The reason that is significant is because it sends a picture. If it was ripped from the bottom to the top, that's a picture of man trying to get to God. But it was ripped from top to bottom because that is a picture of God coming out to get to man. God is saying, I no longer want to live behind a curtain. I don't want to live hidden away. I don't want my presence to be something that, that, is not, that people aren't experiencing on a regular basis. So God said, because now Jesus has sprinkled his blood, he became the ultimate sacrifice because he sprinkled his blood. I'm coming out from behind the veil, and I'm going to come live right on the inside of you. How I many know oh, that's good news? Amen. So now God lives on the inside of us. God never wanted to be behind the veil. God's not a mysterious God. I know people say all the time, well, brother, you, pastor, I know, but God works in mysterious ways. He really doesn't. Well, I've heard, that's, I've heard all my life, God works in mysterious ways. I know, I've heard it too, but it's not Bible. That's nowhere in the Bible. God doesn't work in mysterious ways. God works according to his word. God always lines up with the word of God. And so whatever God is doing in your life, you can find chapter and verse for it. God's not a mysterious God. The whole reason that God created the Ark of the Covenant, the whole reason that God created the tabernacle so that he could live in the middle of his people. He said, this way I can live right there with you. I can be close to you. So God never wants to be far removed. He wants to be right there. So now the high priest would go in, he would sprinkle the blood, and this is, this is when you walk when you walk through that door. You can only go in once a year. And the priest knew that if he did anything wrong, if he didn't follow the law, if he didn't follow all the directions, he would die in there. So he was always going to do everything that he needed to do in order to, to get in and get out, so to speak. So this was a holy place. This was the holy of holies. He's leaving the holy place and coming into a place that's called the holy of holies. In other words, this is being in God's presence. This is what I call a God moment. Remember when Moses saw God? I don't know if you remember the story, but Moses saw just the hind part of God. And when he saw the hind part of God, he came down off the mountain, and then his face glowed. He was like a glow-in-the-dark Moses. And people would look at him, so they made him wear a mask because the glory of God was so powerful on him that they were afraid of him. So the priest would come into the place that is the holy of holies, that God place. This is the God moment. This is what we live for. Listen, I believe, I believe every time we come to church, we ought to have a God moment. I believe it ought to be something more than men do, something more than we can create. I, I believe it. I, I don't believe that we should program every part of the service. See, we, we program our church. We program our services. We know what's going. We're organized. I mean, we practice. We do everything we need to do. But we know that if God shows up, forget it. We don't care anymore. God's more important than what's next on the list there. We don't care. We need a God moment in our life. We need to be in his presence. In his presence is the fullness of joy. A God moment is when the anointing of God and the presence of God shows up. I want you to look at this picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, it's made out of solid gold. The, the, the bottom part of the Ark, this is about a three by three by 18 inch Ark. And so the, the, the bottom part of the Ark is made by the Asiya wood. We talked about that covered with gold, but the lid of the ark, the mercy seat of the ark is one piece of solid gold. But there are rings there that they could put these wooden staffs through the rings on either side of the altar. They put these wood staffs. Wood represents humanity. And this is where the priest 
when it was time to move the ark, they would put this wooden staff through the rings and four priests, one on each corner of the staff, would put the ark of the covenant on their shoulders and that's how they would move the ark of the covenant. That's how they would carry the ark of the covenant on their shoulders. That represents the anointing. We cannot possess the anointing. We can be anointed, but we don't own the anointing. The anointing of God is always on loan. The gifts of the Spirit of God. You can't own the gifts of the Spirit. You can't say, well, my gift is healing. Well, my gift is prophecy. No, you may operate in that, but they all belong to God. They're all on loan to you. That's so important. We'd gone to a conference, and I don't know why I'm sharing this, but I just feel prompted by the Holy Spirit. I'd gone to a conference some years ago, many years ago, and I was so moved by some of the things that I, that I heard. In fact, it wasn't even a conference. I had read a book from a very successful pastor. So I called him. And I said, would you have time to meet with me? Because I'd like to bring my staff. And we'd like, to, we'd like to meet with you. And this man, he's an international pastor known all over he invited us in and we got there and he was so gracious and so kind he, he had dinner catered in for our staff and we, we spent the day with him and he just talked to us but he said this to me he said you have to understand you're a steward you don't, you don't own anything it's not yours everything is on loan and I remember just coming back and I, I went to every office and I put a note on every office door. We got, what, 12 people on staff. I put a note on every door. This is not your office. This is not your office and this is not your office. It's on loan. You don't own this. It's on loan. Take care of it. Because when you're through with it, when God's through with you, it goes to the next guy or the next girl. We don't own any of this. It all belongs to God. That's a very humbling thought, right? How I many know there are a lot of things in our life that we don't own? They're all on loan to God. And I don't know why I shared that, but I'm thinking that's for someone here specifically. So you don't own the anointing, but you can be anointed. Let me close with this this morning. What is the anointing? The anointing is when God puts his super on your natural. I like that. The anointing is when God puts his awe on your sum. And God wants to put his anointing on you. Do you realize this morning that if you're anointed, you're anointed for a purpose? And I want, to share, I want to share one last scripture with you. I've got about five or six scriptures here, but I want to close with this last scripture. The Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What's the opposite of liberty? Bondage. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Here's the scripture I want to share with you. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Isaiah was probably the most prolific prophet he saw things clearly and he said it shall come to pass in that day that this burden shall be taken off of your shoulder and his yoke from off of your neck in other words that bondage that yoke that hurt that hang up that addiction that struggle that pain that you're feeling will be taken off of your shoulder and his yoke that hurt that pain that addiction that hang up that struggle will be taken off of your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing I want you to stand with me this morning 
And this is how we're going to wind things down this morning. This is, how we, this is what we're going to wrap things up with this morning. This is it. We're going to worship God. And I know you're probably tired of hearing me say this, but I got to say it one more time. Worship is not singing karaoke words off the wall. This is not sing along with Colt and the band. That's not worship time. And if all you're doing are singing the words half-heartedly, that's not worship. That's not even offering God anything. Worship is not karaoke. Real worship comes from here. But when we really worship God, the anointing that we're talking about, that holy place, that God moment, the Bible says when we really worship God, there is liberty and there is freedom. And through a real, through a real time of worship, that is when bondage is broken. That is when hurts are healed. That is when addictions, when people are set free from addictions, that is when, uh, that is when the struggle becomes, uh, becomes no longer a struggle because God removes it, all because of worship. When we enter in, when we worship with our whole heart, when we worship to be free, when we worship to be liberated, when we worship to walk out from under the heaviness, God shows up and something happens. It is miraculous. It is a God moment. Now, I told Cole, listen, we always, we always close with a song because I want people to walk out with a song stuck in their mind, right? So when you get in the car, you, you're not just, you know, mean mugging your wife or smacking the kids. You get in the car, you're just thinking about that song and you're, you, you drive off and you kind of road rage in the name of Jesus, you know, amen. <laughs> But this isn't just for a song to stick in your head. This is for liberty. This is for freedom. If you came this morning and you were bound or you were in a struggle, I want you to worship because that's your answer. If you came this morning and there's something that's holding on to your life that you said, I'm tired of being that person, this is where we find freedom. This is where we find liberty. This is where we enter into the presence and the fullness of God. So will you do that this morning? These next few moments, will you worship? Will you worship a king? Will you stand in that God moment? Will you just let God do what he does as we worship him with our whole heart? Let's do it. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for the service today. I really hope that it was a blessing to you because I know you guys are a blessing to us. If you'd like to follow us on YouTube, there's a link below that you can find that. Also, if you need prayer, you can text the number that's below and we'd be glad to pray for you and pray with you. If you want to consider about joining us financially and contributing to what we're doing here, you can also find that link below as well. Look forward to seeing you next week. We love you guys.